Well, we are in week two of our series that we are calling Engage, in which we are looking to God's work in the earliest days of the Christian community and how the earliest believers in Jesus engaged with God, with one another, and with the world. Last week, we looked in Acts 1, and we were shown how the work that God wants to do is not so much around us and for us as it is in us and through us. And that came when Jesus promised the disciples that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them and they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth, which today doesn't sound that weird, but then sounded impossible. You just flip the page over to Acts 2, which we just heard, and we actually see this already happening. The Holy Spirit comes on the disciples, and they begin to communicate to the ends of the earth through this miracle of communicating through other languages. That is serious miracle material if you have ever tried to learn another language. I remember in high school, I was extremely frustrated that my Spanish teacher sort of insisted on teaching us Spanish by only speaking in Spanish. It was extremely frustrating. I'm sure that there are students here who can relate to that. Uh, There is a a possibility here that you could pray for this gift to come upon you during, say, final exams. Might come in handy. Might come in handy lots of other times as well. Uh, Several years ago, Bethany and and I, my wife, were in Russia, and we had, after several days of enjoying Russian cuisine, We were ready for something a little bit different, a little bit more familiar, and so we were so excited when we were walking down the street and we saw this sign, and we thought, pizza sounds perfect. Now, I don't know, if there's anybody who can read Russian, I would be interested to talk to you after the service because I'd be very interested to know what this sign actually says, because I don't know what it says, but I know what it does not say. It doesn't say anything about pizza. (laughs) Because we went into this restaurant and we looked at the menu, and there was definitely no pizza on the menu. And then we asked about pizza, and they definitely had no idea what we were talking about. So I actually have no idea what this sign says. Language can be tricky. In fact, it's been tricky since Genesis chapter 11, when, as the story of the Tower of Babel says, all people had one language, And in their pride, in our pride, we tried to rival God. And so to to keep that foolish pride from ruining us, God confused the languages of the people and scattered them around the world. And what we see here in this passage on on, on the story of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is kind of the reversal of what happened in Genesis 11, where God is not scattering people, but gathering people, and he's not so much using language, different languages to confuse, but to communicate miraculously this message. This is what's going on on this Pentecost Sunday, or this Pentecost day that we read of this Sunday. However, it's important to know that Pentecost was a thing before this happened. Pentecost was actually a festival that faithful Jews had celebrated for centuries. And it was a celebration of the first fruits. Uh, In the Old Testament, you can read about the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of the First Fruits. And it was a a time to thank God for his provision, to offer back the first fruits. And it also was associated with the time that the Ten Commandments were given to Moses. So they also remembered and recommitted themselves to the law that God had given them the way that they were supposed to live. And so this is why all these people have come to Jerusalem. They're here to celebrate this festival, but it does not go according to their expectations. This is a totally different kind of Pentecost. There's a whole new harvest that is happening. And there's actually kind of a new way of understanding how we live in a way that pleases God, not so much a law that tells us what to do, but a spirit that indwells us, that enables us to live the way that God wants us to. There's all kinds of 
exciting like pyrotechnics here. There's like a violent rushing wind. There's tongues of fire descending on the disciples. There's this ability to speak other languages. But I think if we dig a little bit deeper, we can see that there are ingredients, kind of core ingredients to what it is to be a follower of Jesus, what it is to be a community of people following Jesus that are at the core, like the ingredients that you put in at the very beginning of the recipe because they're just fundamental to what you've got, like the mozzarella cheese and the tomato sauce on your imaginary Russian pizza. So I want us to look at these ingredients today because what we can do is look at these ingredients and then look at our own lives and look at how, look at our community and see if what we've got actually matches what the sign says we have outside. And those ingredients are these. Diversity, translatability, which might not be an actual word, but I'm going with it anyway. Inadequacy, and peculiarity. These are four things that have marked the community of Jesus followers since the very beginning. And so first, we have diversity. The, the, the incredible thing about this Pentecost passage is that the disciples are given the ability to speak in all kinds of different languages. And actually, there's a map that will come up here in a second that shows us uh, some of the places that are named by Luke, uh, who wrote this, and, and that Maddie wisely refrained from trying to um, pronounce all of them. But if you look at the map, you can see that it, the, the places that are represented surround Jerusalem. It's like every corner of the world is represented. And as far as Rome and Iran, you can look on that map and see people came from all of those different places. And these are the languages that the disciples were able to communicate in. And so there's one way to think about this is God just sort of like showing off and showing what he can do. But I think he's showing us something about who he is and who he wants his community to be. What this map tells us is that God is no tribal God. He is no national God that is bound by borders or by languages or by cultures, that what he is about is um, sweeping up all cultures and all people into his incredible plan of redemption. And so diversity is like central to what God is calling his people to be. He's, it's almost like he's thinking, okay, I need to start a church. Step one, diversity. It's got to be from the very beginning something that is communicated over the borders of culture and language and ethnicity. And it's represented by all of these nations, which is basically the whole known world to Jews at that time. Now, the church... Uh, does, has done better and worse at this in its, in it, throughout history, and generally, generally worse. <laughs> when the church, when any particular church, looks not at all like their surrounding community, that's probably a sign that something is not firing on all cylinders. Or if an individual Christian only has relationships with people who have their same color skin, speak the same language, have the same background and the same interests, something has probably gone off course. And one of the amazing things about this community from the very beginning, one of the things that has surprised and shocked people is that the church is a place or can be a place, God intends it to be a place where those where diversity becomes not a, not a problem, but a gift. Something absolutely core to who we are. And in our world, in our divided world, what a witness that is to the unifying power of the Spirit. But how do we, how do, we do this in our divided world, which was at least as divided as the world back then? I think this leads us to the second ingredient of the church, and that is this word that I might have made up, translatability. If you look at that map, if you remember that map, you'll see that um, there were a people who spoke the language uh, Arabic, we might say, and Latin. They were coming all the way from, from Rome and the Arabian Peninsula, which 
those people culturally, though they were all Jewish, they had languages and cultures that were as different as Arabic and Italian today. And the miracle is that all of them hear these disciples speaking in their own language. They say in verse 7, I think it is, utterly amazed, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans, how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? What happens is that God immediately turns his people into translators, where they are communicating this, the wonders of God, as it says, in their own native tongues. Now, what's interesting is that scholars suggest that actually at this time, probably most of these pilgrims spoke either Greek or Aramaic. Those were kind of like the main languages in the empire. And so the disciples probably could have gotten the message across in a certain way if they had just spoken one of those languages. They could have maybe even had an Aramaic for speakers of other languages, uh, like workshop to brush up in case people needed to be reminded. But they didn't actually have to speak in other languages to communicate what they were doing. But what God wanted to do was to cross those boundaries and meet people where they are in the language that their mother taught them when they were growing up, as close to the core of who they are. That's where God wanted this message to land. And so he didn't want anybody kind of needing to come to learn a new language or to hear it in some other form. He wanted to move to where they are, and so he, his spirit transforms his disciples into translators so that this message hits home in the deepest places of the hearers. This is, again, something that the church has uh, done better and worse at in its history. There are a lot of um, amazing examples of the church translating the message into the language of the people rather than expecting the people to learn the language of the church. And actually, we've got Chris and Kay Smooz with us this morning, who that is their whole job and calling, is to communicate the message of the gospel in ways that people can understand it so that language is not a barrier. Uh, but the church, interestingly, in other places, tends to do this a little bit better than the, the church here in the U.S. We tend to forget about this need of translation when we um, are seeking to engage with the world around us. And sometimes we end up using language that becomes almost like a foreign language. And one example of this is this video that I'll invite you to show, which is a few years old, but is still really good. So take a look. So some of you might speak Russian, you can help me with my uh, sign. Some of you might speak Christian, and can help people understand what that meant. A lot of times we just start using language that makes sense inside the community, but that it doesn't, requires translation to people outside the community. And we often forget that from the very beginning, our role as disciples of Jesus is, that, is to be made translators, to communicate the wonders of God in the languages of the people around us, in ways that can be understood. This is the way God works. When the Spirit is at work, he causes us to cross those boundaries, whatever they may, are, may be, age, demographics, race, we begin to have this urgency and this ability to, to not just use jargon, but to say it with meaning in ways that, that make sense and hit home. And I think this is the way God works because it's the way that he worked in Jesus. When he wanted to communicate God, his love for us, the clearest way to do it was to send his son Jesus to come and be one of us, to inhabit our space. He moved toward us and he took on our human condition. He took on human language. He translated the things of God into, the, into human life so that we could get it in the deepest parts of ourselves, and so that we could begin to participate in that work as the human beings that we are. So what's happening in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost is really just the spirit of Jesus doing the work of Jesus through the people of Jesus, not in an individual way, but in a corporate way, using us, his followers, to do the very same kind of translation work. 
And so as the church, this is, this is part of what we are called to do, is to embrace this role as, as translators. Oftentimes, we, again, fail at this and end up doing things like using fellowship as a verb, actually using the word fellowship at all. <laughs> Unless you're reading The Lord of the Rings, nobody ever says fellowship. And so we're called to, to move out into these spaces where we are communicating in ways that people understand. This is what the Spirit does. We don't ask people to come to us and, and know it all before they can understand because Jesus didn't ask people to know it all before he engaged with them. Jesus went towards us, and so as his people, we go to the world, which is not to say that we have it all together or that we know it all. The third ingredient of the church that we see here is inadequacy. It's baked in the recipe from the very beginning. You can see it in verse 7 where they're utterly amazed and they say, are not these people Galileans? How is it that we hear them speaking in our own native languages? You might be able to pick up the subtext of that, are these people not Galileans? Galilee was not a place that was known for its uh, cosmopolitan sophistication. Galilee, Galileans were known primarily, the main linguistic trait they were known for were for having really heavy accents. And so if you were looking for translators, you would not go to the job fair at Galilee Tech. That would be like looking for a good pizza joint in Russia. You're probably not going to find it. But these are exactly the people that God wants to use. This is the way God works. He takes inadequate people and works through them on purpose. He takes the broken down and the beaten up. He takes the overlooked and the undervalued. He takes the heavy-hearted and the hurting, and he uses us, people just like that. So this is a great reminder for those of us who are pretty proud of the work that God is doing through us, and we think we've got it all together because we've read a bunch of books and uh, we know sort of how the Christian thing works. It's a reminder that it, it is our inadequacy that God wants to use. And it's also good news for those of us who are pretty sure that we have nothing to offer and nothing to bring, and we're, our lives are a total mess because those are exactly the kinds of people. The, the Galileans are the people that God wants to use to shock and surprise and move his kingdom forward. The Bible is all about this. Like from the very beginning, it's God stacking the deck against himself so that he can come through. It's God using the unlikely people so that people will take notice. It's all about his, his power showing up in our weakness. It's all about his all-surpassing abilities being somehow contained in fragile clay jars of human life. And so this third ingredient of the church is inadequacy. We are constantly dependent upon God to do his work through us. It's because we're inadequate that people take notice, which leads us to the fourth ingredient of the church that we see here, and that is peculiarity. When the Spirit is working, people notice, and they try to figure out what to make of it. In our passage, the best they can come up with is that they have been drinking. But when God's Spirit is working in this way, we are peculiar in all the right ways. When this diverse community of translators is crossing the boundaries that the world sets up and the barriers and the walls that are, that are supposed to keep us apart, when we are doing things that don't make any sense that people like us should be doing, people ask questions and wonder why. A lot of times, we are peculiar for things like using fellowship as a verb, rather than the incredibly bold and risky ways that we are reaching out to people that no one else is reaching out to, the way that we are befriending people that uh, the world would say we have no reason to befriend, the way that we are seeking to move towards people where they are and connect with them where they are, rather than expecting them to come to us, when that happens, that is the right kind of peculiarity that, brings, that makes people ask questions, that leads them to look at the God who is at work through these inadequate people. So diversity 
translatability, inadequacy, and peculiarity are things that have marked the people of God since the very, very beginning. This is some of the ways that you know the Spirit is at work. So how do we, how do we get in on this? Well, we begin, I believe, by asking God to work in us. There's no work that he's going to do outside of us or through us without doing work in us. This is happening because, what we read of is happening because the Holy Spirit is at work. And so the starting place for us is to ask the Holy Spirit to do it. Last week, Pastor John invited us to take this promise from Jesus in Acts 1.8, where Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And Pastor John invited us to translate that into the first person and, and embrace this promise. Begin to, to expectantly look for the Spirit to be at work. And we said, I will be God's witness when the power of the Spirit comes upon me, and I will be his witness in my Judea. What I want to do today is kind of translate that one more time and take that same verse of Acts 1-8 and turn it into a prayer. And the prayer might look something like this. Dear God, send your spirit into my life in a new way so that I might see you in a new way and so that I can share what I've seen. That, by the way, is all that it means to be a witness, is to share what you've seen. And so if we want to learn how to be a part of, be following Jesus in the way that the early church was, we, we need to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, as the early church did. So a place to begin is simply by praying that God would send his Spirit into our lives in a new way. And when we do that, God makes some opportunities available. And there are a couple opportunities that we have this morning before us, that some of which we've already talked about or we've already taken a look at. And these aren't the only possible ways to engage through the Holy Spirit in a new way, but I want to lift them up because they are opportunities that are right here in front of us, and they are ways for you to take a next step before you even leave the building. The first is these uh, groups that are in the insert in your bulletin. Those are groups that many of which are going to be looking at how Jesus did this as we look at how the early church engaged with people around them, the groups are going to look on the individual, personal way that Jesus reached out to a diverse set of people, the way that he communicated in ways that they could understand, the way that he reached out to them and called them in spite of their inadequacy, and the way that that made people sit up and take notice. And we're going to be looking at how we might follow his lead in being more attentive to the people around us, the relationships. We might see what people are actually wondering and, and meeting their actual needs and becoming better translators of this message that God has entrusted to us. The second possibility is this incredibly amazing work of God's Spirit that bears so many of the marks of the, that we've discussed already this morning, uh, this group Acts for Youth. I mean, Acts for Youth is this diverse group of people who are coming together and seek and un discovering understanding and relationship across cultural and ethnic barriers. It's a bunch of inadequate volunteers who are learning what it means to just step out and follow Jesus into those relationships. It's, it's meeting people where they are rather than where we expect they might be, and it is the sort of thing that makes people stand up and take notice. I don't know if you know much about the story of Acts for Youth, but it started around a decade ago when Kevin Good, this white soccer coach, caught this vision of, of helping at-risk boys in Baltimore City flourish because someone, a young African-American man that he was mentoring, was tragically shot and killed. So this group starts with eight boys at one school, and people start taking notice of what's happening, and the influence just continues to expand until today they're in three schools, and they serve both boys and girls. But even more than that, they this year began to move into actually the daytime curriculum at Walter P. Carter Elementary and Middle School. 
Because they were meeting needs in ways that made sense, they were communicating the wonders of God in the languages of these students, the, the value of it was, was instantly recognizable. And so Kevin Good was telling us the story about how this happened, and he was ex- describing how he was having this conversation with the, with the principal and exploring this opportunity. And the principal was like, kind of like it says in verse 12, amazed and perplexed, and she asked him not what does this mean, but what does this cost? And Kevin was able to say, it doesn't cost you anything because the church is supporting this work. This diverse community of inadequate translators want this message of God's desire for human flourishing to to be for all people, and so they're behind it. They're engaged. And so this incredible work is something that is going forward and causing people to stand up, sit up and take notice because it is the work of the Holy Spirit. And we've already talked about ways that we can be involved. And if you're feeling like this isn't something that I can really do, perfect, because God loves using Galileans who don't know what they're doing. You could try out your Russian pizza recipe. When we engage in a new way with the people around us, beginning with the Spirit, when we engage with the Spirit in a new way and invite Him in, it is amazing what we can see Him do. And so I'll invite you to actually join me in this prayer as a way of closing this sermon, as a way of inviting God to do a new work in us. So let's just pray it together. Dear God, Send your Holy Spirit into my life in a new way so that I can see you in a new way and share what I've seen. Amen.